Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here on Sunday. It's really uh, nice to see everyone virtually. Thank you for coming to our last town hall. I am the DPO candidate for Dufferin Caledon, and uh, I just want you all to note this town hall is being recorded. Thank you for joining the Stronger Economy Together. And we know all about that. We've been talking about it for a while. And it's going to be very central to our campaigns and everything that we're all about as Greens. Before we again begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, and as we open this space together, this is crucial. We have to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional territory and unceded Indigenous lands here uh, and across Ontario. Um, they're a practice that we've all for now, um, and it has become uh, common across our institutions, certainly among the Greens. And it means that, you know, it's evolved. How we acknowledge the land is no longer just a box that we tick off. They're a crucial starting point, these land acknowledgements, for all of the work we need to do towards genuine reconciliation, authentic reconciliation, deep reconciliation. So for today, I join you. Dufferin Caledon spans two treaties. Uh, here in Orangeville from my restaurant, it's the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and the Odawa of the Three Fires Confederacy. Uh, last night, I had uh, the great privilege of going for a walk with one of my very close friends who is uh, from one of these groups. And she reminded me about all of the things that I could be doing as a parent and as a citizen and, and as an to, to meet the goals of reconciliation. So I think as we work towards a better future for, for all of Canada and in particular for our Indigenous communities. We have to ensure that we are enshrining the ideals of reconciliation deep within all the work we do. So the example that we've talked about a lot at this convention is the idea of seven generation planning and thinking. And if you're not familiar with it yet, you know, I would encourage us to talk about it more in the chats. Look up um, the land that you are on and uh, there's a link that you can go to um, on the Ontario government website. So it's ontario.ca slash page slash map and Ontario treaties and reserves. And uh, I think that one of our tech people can provide that link uh, in the chat as well. So you can look up exactly which treaty covers the land that you're on. Um, and so treaty 19 uh, was, was uh, concluded in 1880. And I, I, I feel that we have a lot more to learn from here in Calad or in Dufferin Caledon. We have the Dufferin uh, Cultural Resource Circle that really has helped me uh, understand more and I'd encourage you to connect with those groups in your own uh, community. So thank you very much. Um, this, this event is sort of all about building a stronger economy in Ontario, one that works for people and planet, and we wanna get your feedback on our platform. And we have this great, it's really exciting because uh, we have Mike Schreiner, our leader, and also deputy leaders, uh, Abhijit Manet and Diane Sachs. And it's very exciting because it's the first time all three of you are together. Um, you know, virtually, but still together. So uh, this is going to be a great, great town hall. Um, and just a quick housekeeping. Um, we'll be using the polling feature as we did yesterday at Plenary. And so if you still have some questions about how to use the polling feature, you can uh, use the Q&A figure out how to use it if you're, if you're just here today. Um, and that'll help guide our discussion. Uh, today's town hall is a safe space for all of the guests here and uh, the speakers and the participants. Um, our equ equity officers online with us today, Ran Zhu. So, you know, just to confirm and reiterate, there's zero, zero tolerance for hate, abusive or discriminatory language or harassment. We ask that everyone participate with respect for one another 
and in the sphere of problems doing that. So um, before we pass the spotlight on to our speakers this afternoon, I want to kick things off with an audience poll. So uh, we're thinking about, you know, a green economy, what that looks like. You know, there's so many facets to it, but it would be really good to zero in on, you know, what is the thing? What are you most excited about when you think of a green economy? Um, is it green retrofits and buildings, renewable energy, green transportation, sustainable agriculture, local food, clean tech and innovation, conservation, or green jobs? Um, so you can see that there in the little widget to the left of your screen, um, and you can select any one of those. It's too bad we can't select more than one, but <laughs> they're all so, so crucial. Um, I, for one, obviously I own a restaurant. I'm, I'm in my restaurant right now. Local food is um, incredibly important to me. Um, and that we farm on um, and that we need to survive. We need to be stewards of the land. I'm not trying to sway you to, to choose the, the uh, local food option, of course. I just, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's important to my life and a lot of my friends are farmers and some of the activist work that I've been doing around here is protecting farmland from sprawl. And so uh, local food systems are, are crucial uh, for, for equity, food equity, food justice, and uh, obviously, um, and conservation feeds into that, green jobs, you know, there's, it just goes on, just waiting for not seeing them. I wonder if I can vote too. Oh, I guess I can. There we go. All right, let me know uh, in the Q&A if you have, oh, some results are starting to come up here. Okay, oh, looks like 35% of people also agree with me that food is very important. <laughs> We uh, and uh, green retrofits and building renewable energy, clean tech and innovation. Uh, and funny enough, my friend has an electric car. I um, hopefully my next car will be electric, but in the meantime, I do commute on a bike. <laughs> I commute on a bike, which is which is really nice. And uh, yeah. green jobs are hopefully going to be absolutely central. They're central to a green new deal. Um, they're central to our platform. We know that you know so many of our economic problems um, with respect to wages, declining wages, um, job scarcity, fact that folks don't know if you know fluctuation in oil prices would will mean that they even have a job this is in the energy sector i have a lot of friends who actually work in the energy sector and you know when we talk about sustainability we're not just talking about the environmental side of it but we're also talking about you know the the sustainability of their ability to pay their mortgages in in industries that are so volatile this is why cre cre clean green jobs are really such a central feature of our should be and needs to be a central feature of our economy. All right. So I, I can't quite tell if the poll is complete but, or if the voting is done, but it appears that it probably is. So we can move on to Mike. Um, and I'm so excited to introduce Mike Schreiner, our, our leader, introduce us to our panelists. Thanks. Thanks, Laura, so much for the great introduction and getting us through the first poll results. And uh, thank everyone for joining us today and being part of this vital conversation about what our economy could look like, especially in the post-COVID world. And um, it's so important for us to hear from your, all of you and to answer your questions and have your input. But I also think an important part of policy development is to talk with experts and i have two experts joining me on the panel today which i'm very excited about and so i'd like to it's just an honor for me uh to welcome both of our deputy leaders and before i do that i just want to take a moment to acknowledge that i'm back home in guelph after a weekend at weeds park 
Uh, and Guelph is situated on the Treaty 3 lands of the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation. And I want to really just reaffirm the Green Party's commitment, uh, especially to the truth and reconciliation process. I think the last couple of weeks has really highlighted the importance of learning the truth. But I also think um, the reconciliation part is how we apply that truth and take action uh, to dismantle colonialism, systemic racism, and, and to address uh, that legacy. And so it's better for everyone moving forward for the next seven generations. And I know that's hard work, but it's work that we're all deeply committed to. So um, our two deputy leaders, um, I, I've been working with Abhijit Mane for a number of years now. Uh, and Abhijit did a fantastic job uh, helping me in my campaign in the last provincial election, as well as, as um, running his own campaign. And if any of you had an opportunity to watch uh, TBO Agenda last week, Abhijit was the, one of the young candidates that represented the Green Party and did an amazing job. And I think it will give you tremendous insight into Abhijit and who he is. And our other deputy leader, Diane Sachs. Many of you probably know Diane as Ontario's environmental commissioner that uh, Doug Ford so unceremoniously fired. And I, and I think I have Diane's position, uh, permission to say it that way. Uh, he literally eliminated the position. Uh, and prior to that, prior to being the environment commissioner, Diane did such tremendous work as the environmental commissioner of Ontario. Um, she's also internationally recognized as one of the world's leading environmental lawyers. And for me, it's an honor to have two wonderful, highly capable, committed and passionate deputy leaders to work with me because as you know, it takes a team to build a party, to build a movement and bring forward the kind of change that Ontario so desperately needs. And so I'm gonna open the, I'm gonna ask them a few questions and then I think Laura's going to come in and take questions from the audience and ask all three of us. And so I'm gonna direct the first question to Diane. And I think I'm gonna preface it by saying that, you know, it's clear that the current Ford government uh, is is believes that economic um, uh, growth is central to to the future, and that it comes at the expense of the environment. And we can see that from day one, the Ford government dismantled the previous government's climate action plan, uh, canceled renewable energy projects, but since then has been systematically dismantling environmental protection in the name of economic recovery. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm, um, I just want to get your perspective on why that is so dangerous and why it is important for Ontario as we emerge from this pandemic to do it in a way that our economic recovery is aligned with our climate obligations and, and the need to address the climate emergency that's bearing down on us as well. Well, thank thank you, Mike, and I'm I'm uh, I'm in Toronto, a dish from this one spoon territory. Um, you're absolutely right. Everything that I've seen about the Ford government is they mm, are determined to increase uh, economic gains for a pretty small number of people, and to heck with the consequences. So this. Um, what I've seen is that there are two points of view of thinking about the relationship between the environment and the economy. There are people, perhaps like the, the, the Ford government, who say it would be too hard to change the current system. We have to continue it the way it is. And, well, the consequences really don't matter that much because we need things to continue the way they will, the way they are, then they will. Now, we know, we Greens, that this will end very badly, that as we use up the natural capital of the world, we are moving rapidly to a place where we will have natural and social collapse if we continue as we are. And the experience we've just had with COVID is just a, a foretaste of what climate change will bring us. So people like me who pay an awful lot of attention to the science say, we 
can't continue the way we have been um, because the consequences will be dreadful and therefore and therefore we will stop. Um, but stopping isn't that easy either. So we do know for sure that uh, pretending that the environment, that the economy is all that matters and the environment can be taken for granted, that's a recipe for disaster. And we're pretty getting very close to that disaster. Uh, we also know, and the International Panel on Climate Change really showed this, that we still have an opportunity to make both things better. That there's still not a big window, but there's still a window to use a regenerative approach, Laura just mentioned regenerative agriculture, that we can in fact make both the environment and the economy and human welfare quite a bit better, but we have to start right now. And uh, Ontario is, is going in pretty much the opposite direction. The, one of the studies I, I did in, for my last climate report, we commissioned um, the, a top end economic model of what's the cheapest way, what's the best, lowest cost way for our economy to reach our climate targets and still preserve as much as possible of the way of life that we have. And it gave a pretty clear recipe, none of which is rocket science. The first thing is to absolutely maximize conservation. Right now, we waste roughly two thirds of the primary energy that we that we take. Um, well, we could do enormously better than that, and we would save money, and we would create a huge number of jobs, and simplest example is retrofitting existing buildings. So conservation to the absolute maximum is the first. Um, the second is to drive fossil fuels out of the electricity system. And again, uh, Ford's taking us in the opposite direction on that. Um, there are lots of opportunities. We have to use all the tools. We can't just treat the electricity system as a silo. And the third is to electrify um, everything possible so that we minimize the use of fossil fuels. So that's how we reduce our energy footprint. But if we think about it more broadly, here's, here's another set of threes that we could need to keep in mind. The first is the absolute first thing we have to do is stop making things worse. Uh, so much of what the current government is doing is actively increasing environmental degradation, increasing fossil fuel dependence, increasing inequality, which is digging us deeper into the hole we need to get out of. So we have to stop fossil fuel lock-in. We have to be addressing inequality. The second thing is we do need to actively build a circular and regenerative economy that, as Mark Carney said in his new book, every business has to be actively improving the part of the world that they affect, not degrading it, uh, turning the natural world into short-term cash. And can that be done? Yes. Will it be easy? No. Will the market do it by itself? No. But is it possible? Yes. And it's essential. Um, and as we think about a regenerative economy, we have to be thinking about equity. We have to be thinking about a, an inclusive, uh, a better future for all. And then the third thing is to think again about our institution and our taxes. We are now in a situation where businesses have a strong financial incentive to get rid of people because people are a cost and invest in machinery and technology because that's considered capital and there's lots of tax incentives for that. And so you get jobs being destroyed because of the rules that we've set up. We don't have to have those rules. These are not God-given, these are human choices and they could be different and they should be different. So yes, our top priority should be creating good, clean jobs that are good for people, the economy and the planet so that we have a community to live in that is more healthy, more whole, better able to work together, better able to withstand the hammer blows that climate change is bringing us. Yeah, Diane, that's, um, as always, such a thorough answer. Uh, but I want to just pull with one of the threads a little bit in what you talked about, and that is the need for what some people might call a just transition or an inclusive transition. How do we, how do we, uh, address people's anxieties and fears. I think some people are worried that if we change our existing lifestyle, our existing economic structures, they're not going to have a job. They're not going to be able to pay their mortgage. Um, a lot of people worry, particularly who work in the oil and gas industry. Uh, and I know I was lobbied hard when the, the line, Stimbridge Line 5 was debated at Queen's Park. And I want to thank you and Abhijit for being there with me as the only person in the legislature 
to vote against that and just just um, supporting me and you know making those hard votes when when there is strong um, you know lo lobbying pressure and and a lot of that's driven I think by people's economic anxieties and so do you have some thoughts on how do we address those anxieties so we can make the transition that we all know that if we're going to have a livable planet, we have to make. Thank you, Mike. Um, there's a lot more to the just transition than just people who work in oil and gas, but let's talk about that for a second. The first thing is that there are fewer and fewer people in Canada and almost none in Ontario who work in oil and gas. Uh, there are, I mean, I've seen some figures in the U.S., more people now work at a single fast food restaurant chain than work in the entire coal industry in the entire U.S. So we have a very disproportionate sense as to how many people we're actually talking about. In Canada, a lot of the people who work in oil and gas have already lost their jobs. This has not been a good few years for them, and there's no reason to think it's going to get better as the world starts to turn away from fossil fuels and the even the International Energy Agency, a pretty right wing group, recognizing that it's time to this year to stop any further investment in new production of oil and gas. So there's going to be lots of good people who need new jobs. The, the great news is there's lots of good work that matches the skill of those people. So we we do need some government support for for people making a transition from from one career to another. We need to be really focused on it, but we need to keep our eye on the enormous number of opportunities that there are for great new jobs in our communities that count the upsource. That's why I mentioned retrofits. Retrofitting homes, that's work that gets done here by skilled people here, not something that can be made in China and sent in a box. So we, how do we ensure a start just transition? We start right now we bring everybody to the table and we don't give up. We never give up. We just never give up. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I'm going to direct, I'm going to bring Abhijit into the conversation now. And for any of you who haven't followed Abhijit's Twitter feed, you should, because he is such a strong advocate for um, an inclusive green economy. And so I want to build on what Diane was just talking about, Abhijit, and to say that you know I, so many people i talk to talk about the fact that the climate crisis is going to hit the most marginal first and worst and we've certainly seen that with covid and and the inequities that covid has exposed i i think the climate crisis is just going to escalate that even more and so i just want some and you've been very vocal on these issues abajit i'm wondering what does creating a, an inclusive green economy look like for you and what are the kinds of policies the Green Party needs to be putting forward to ensure that the transition to a green economy um, is inclusive of everyone uh, in our society? Thank you for that, Mike. Um, firstly, I also want to say uh, it's such a pleasure being here with you and Diane and Laura um, for our first, I guess, virtual, albeit fireside chat. Um, I'm coming to you from the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. And to your question, Mike, um, I, I think an inclusive green economy is exactly within the green vision that we've already created. When we talk about a green and caring economy, that's what the green vision is. I think when we look at the caring part of that, of that uh, phrase, that's the green and caring vision that the Green Party is, of Ontario is advocating for. Uh, last uh, yesterday in our candidates panel, um, I talked about what, like my, what the world I want uh, to be is going to be like, and it's going to be centered around justice. And that's what this is about. At the end of the day, it's about justice because the ones who are uh, being affected the most are the ones contributing the least to climate change. And, and to the climate crisis. Um, and so this disproportionate uh, way that, th that they're being affected, it, that's the unfairness. And so that's why we need that just recovery. Um, um, and, and so that includes you know, things like, there's, there's so much. Um, firstly, we have to make sure we put people's health and well-being first. There can be no exceptions to that. 
Health is a human right. Uh, it's interdependent uh, with the health and well-being of ecological systems. Um, and this pandemic has also taught us that the right to good health care and good health of the people is not only an inalienable right, but it's also uh, something that's actually good for the economy. I know you've said this many times, uh, where you can't have a healthy economy without healthy people. And so we saw that we saw that happening with New Zealand. We saw that happening with Australia. The way they dealt with their pandemic ensured that their economies stayed open. Uh, they had packed stadiums when we were in the depths of our pandemic. Um, so investments in healthcare are crucial. Um, also, another thing we have to focus on is uh, ensuring that we strengthen the social safety net uh, of our society and provide relief directly to people because we have to focus those relief efforts on people, particularly those who are um, structurally discriminated by existing systems. That's folks with disabilities, uh, indigenous communities, and many other marginalized or even especially racialized uh, communities. So direct aid can be in the form of, you know, one idea that we've always advocated for is universal basic income or a guaranteed livable income. Uh, it's not only popular now because of the way people saw CERB roll out even though CERB was sort of limited and didn't really help many groups who could have used it. But it, if it was essentially a proto-UBI, which uh, was sort of, uh, I think, has changed the Canadian mentality uh, on its acceptance. We also have to make sure we prioritize the needs of workers and communities um, because support must be distributed in a manner that's consistent with things like Indigenous sovereignty, uh, climate resilient economy uh, and workers rights, which includes safe and fair labor standards and the right to unionize. Um, now during this pandemic, we saw who were the ones who stepped up to the plate. It, it wasn't the billionaires, it was, it was the uh, transportation workers, it was our healthcare workers, it was our elder care workers, education workers, and many more. Forgive me if I haven't mentioned your sector, I'm, I'm sure it was crucial as well. We need to ensure that those added benefits that they got uh, during the pandemic, many of the pay upgrades and whatnot, that they stay there. And I know you've advocated for Queen, at Queen's Park about doing just that, for example, for PSWs. Uh, and the ones that didn't get the pay increase, kind of like uh, um, our midwives, for example, I think they should get uh, a, a, the same recognition and, and benefits as well. Um, and then also, I think we have to make sure we build resilience into our systems in the first place, because this pandemic laid those systems bare open. Uh, we can't recover from this crisis by entrenching uh, systems that will cause the next crisis, uh, whether that's the political system, you know, with first past the post, which causes, which causes all these um, uh, you know, false majority governments to come in in the first place, which is the root of all these problems. And uh, or whether that's the economic system built simply on measures like GDP, which are kind of antiquated now when we think about it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the example of New Zealand, which is now shifting towards a well-being focused economy. I think that's something that we should be applying here in Canada as well. I'm, whenever I think of GDP, I'm always reminded of this quote from Bobby Kennedy. Um, I know it's, it's a little old, but he's kind of a hero of mine. And uh, if it's all right, I'd love to read this quote. It, it talks about, you know, like how the GDP is something that is measuring all these horrible things, yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And I think that's such a powerful quote about how we need that transition to happen. And then lastly, also, I think we need to build solidarity and equity across communities, across generations and across borders. Um, in a globalized world, what affects us affects us all. Uh, and I'm, whenever I think of solidarity, I'm always reminded of this movie. I don't know if uh, you've, you or Diane or Laura have watched it. It's called Pride. It's a, it's a British film 
Um, and I mean, what better month to watch it? So if you guys, if you guys have the opportunity, I highly recommend it. But it's about a true story in Britain, uh, and I think 80s Britain, so during Thatcher, when there was an LGBTQ activist group in London who went to Wales, where there were miners who were striking against the Thatcher government and stood in solidarity with them, uh, despite those two uh, groups be not go getting along very well in the beginning. But the solidarity message in it is, is so powerful that, you know, where whoever you are, wherever you are, with our struggle together, we are stronger. And so I think that's something that we need to uh, apply in our daily lives as well. Whenever we see uh, injustice happening anywhere, uh, I think we need to use our voices uh, to support them. And then lastly, I also want to touch upon upholding Indigenous rights. We opened with uh, a great land acknowledgement. Laura, thank you for that. But a just recovery needs to uphold Indigenous rights and include full and effective participation of Indigenous peoples in line with the standard of free prior and informed consent. Uh, we live here on land that our ancestors settled and some of us as newcomers, but the systems we navigate, the structures that keep the status quo in place uh, was built upon millions of deaths of the original inhabitants. So justice, which is what I was talking about all this time, is ensuring we dismantle those structures and replace them with structures that uphold the rights of our indigenous brothers and sisters and two-spirit people. Great, thanks for that, Abhijit. And I'm gonna ask, before I bring Laura back to do another poll question, I wanna ask a follow-up to you, Abhijit, and I'll ask Diane to quickly comment on this question as well so she can think about it while you're answering it, is um, both of you have been pretty vocal about the importance role that small businesses play in the vibrancy and vitality of our communities. I know Laura is speaking to us from, from her, the small business she, she owns. Um, and I was a longtime small business owner myself and know what an important role small businesses can play in a green economy. But I would say just in building great communities. And I think one of the things that excite me about uh, transition to a greener world is just more vitality, vibrancy, and connections within our communities. Uh, so instead of sprawling out, we focus in on how do we build great communities within our, within our existing neighborhoods, streets, downtowns, et cetera. And small businesses have been hit so hard uh, during the pandemic, especially. And so, and, you know, I, I think the last time I looked pre-pandemic, about 65% of private sector jobs in Ontario were actually from small businesses. That's probably been affected by COVID. But so I'm just curious, Abhiji, some thoughts you have on, on the important role that small businesses can play in, in a green transition and in building just great communities that people want to live in. Yeah, I know that's such an important question, Mike. And whenever I'm making calls here in Beaches East York, um, you know, a lot of the small business owners I talk to when I mention that green priorities are for small business owners, they really, you know, uh, their voices light up and you really see it because they're hit so hard. So we need to make sure that there, there is a comprehensive green recovery package that sets us on our path to achieve those uh, critical climate targets that we need, while also acknowledging the realities of uh, small businesses in this historic moment. So uh, I know you are a, a small business owner, so I think funding programs are critical, but I think equally important will be specific investments to build the capacity of those small businesses uh, to prioritize uh, this work and then modify their business activities to reduce emissions. I remember hearing from uh, Jay Reeser, uh, Laura, you mentioned farmers. He's a longtime farmer out in uh, Markham. Uh, and he said one of the biggest barriers in reducing emissions is a lack of financial resources and time. Even with the funding programs that are out there, there's most of the time, you know, small business owners are too busy to look at these programs, or uh, especially now when they're scrambling to survive, you know? Uh, so I think when we are talking about retrofit programs for small businesses, I think it's important to emphasize that thousands of you know, smaller greenhouse gas reduction projects uh, probably are better uh, and, and making sure that they're affordable as well. And then if we want those bigger, larger scale, deeper retrofits, 
then I think we need to make sure that there's enough credit available, either through grants or loans, um, uh, that will um, that could be tied to the depth of the, like you can tie it to the the amount of uh, GHG reductions as well. Um, and another thing uh, I've also heard lots of small businesses say is that they want a youth internship program focused on the green recovery, which would enable business networks and associations to connect their members directly with those stimulus opportunities. Um, and so by equipping those small businesses with in-house expertise in to manage those green um, uh, recovery activities, they'll be able to respond more quickly, I think, to green stimulus. So those are some of the ideas that I've heard from small businesses. Great. I think, thank you for that, Abhijit. Now, Diane, do you want to spend a couple minutes with your thoughts? Sure. There's there's lots of things that the province can and should be doing to helping small businesses. I certainly agree with Abhijit, having run a small business myself for more than a quarter century. Um, nobody has time or brain space. So one of the things that's really helpful is green economy hubs. Um, we've got some of those in Ontario. We have, a, we have a network, but it could be a lot better. It could include a concierge service to give people one-on-one -on -one answers on where can I get what I need? Who could I partner with? What kind of grants are available? Um, one of the things that I, I wrote about this week, you might have seen my article in Corporate Nights, was particularly about PACE programs, property assessed clean energy programs. How do we finance the kind of green energy retrofits that can allow small businesses as well as homeowners to dramatically reduce the energy consumption of their buildings? And this can be done absolutely in a way that's quite low risk for lenders, but it's got to involve partnership with between the public and the private sector because the private sector has the money. Um, the public sector is dealing with comparatively small change compared to the scope of the need. Uh, so I would certainly encourage those who are interested in that to uh, look up my article in, in Corporate Nights. Um, we know the government procurement can make a very big difference for small business. Uh, the government procurement process is generally designed to be pretty inaccessible for small business, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, we can also think about the specific needs of small business, particularly during COVID. And one of the things um, uh, I launched a petition early during the, the, uh, the pandemic about the need for help for small business to be able to compete with, for example, Amazon. When it's too scary to go to the store, I mean, somebody like myself, I, I wasn't going to go shopping. So it's very easy at any hour of the day or night to go online and order what I want from Amazon. And it'll show up at my door, which is COVID safe. But there's no similar way to deal with local businesses. And so there have been a lot of ideas. Of how do we get a low carbon local delivery system? And we, we've seen some precedents in Germany. Um, but that's not even municipalities in Ontario aren't even allowed to do such a thing under the current municipal act. So setting up a system for clean local delivery in a cooperative way, um, that would be great. The German system involved local people, often seniors, driving bikes or electric bikes to do local deliveries. And so you get local employment, you get to meet your neighbors, you get to buy locally and keep the carbon footprint way down. Um, and then finally, there's the question of infrastructure. We've seen a real sea change in the last generation uh, in terms of the impoverishment of investment in public infrastructure. And that leaves people more and more on their own and makes public space less and less attractive. So you get car uh, roads treated basically like sewers for cars, people driving by. That doesn't necessarily mean they're good for local business. So public infrastructure that, that makes it easy and pleasant to walk and bike in local areas to shopping streets, uh, well, that improves the, opportunity, the business opportunities for small business. Um, it also improves their air quality and their health. And we can make many more of our uh, cities beautiful, pleasant places both to live and to shop. And uh, when the air quality is better, which you also get by reducing cars, there's been at least some preliminary evidence people shop more when they feel better and they feel better when they have cleaner air. So let's try that. Yeah, that sounds good. So Laura, I'm gonna switch chairs and I'm gonna go into my panelist chair and turn things over to you to do the next poll question and then to ask the three of us questions. Perfect, thank you so much, Mike. Those were, I think we can all agree that 
Um, all three of you have such a thorough, um, detailed, you know, honest and authentic sort of vision for our economy. It's it's super inspiring, and I just I wish I could take more or notes so much that I feel I can learn um, from the three of you about what are these solutions. So, um, all right, let's move to our next poll. Um, we want to start with another poll. Uh, and if you look over, uh, you can see it should pop up. Um, what is your top concern when you think about Ontario's economy? So, oh, here it comes up. Perfect. So, is ages, racism, the opportunity to find work I want, enjoy, being equipped to adapt to a changing economy, adequate support if I lose my job, can't find work, employer biases, finding work nearby in my community, language barriers, or finding affordable housing. So what is your top concern? So just, I'm going to vote here. I'm going to do that. Oops. There we go. All right. So the to load up. Okay, panel. So far I'm seeing fair wages at 5%. 4% for, oh, 8% for fair wages, 7%. 20, 26%. 25% say being equipped to adapt to a changing economy. I can't find a job. If I lose my job, can't find work. 6%. Finding work nearby in my community. 6%. All right. Finding affordable housing. 32% uh, for finding affordable housing. And I know that... Um, the GPO has just released a paper on affordable housing. At our last convention, we uh, did a lot of work on affordable housing. Uh, um, I don't know where, but we had that window where we wrote down, you know, what does home look like to you? Um, you know, what are the different types of, you know, places that we call home? And uh, we, we're we really working on it. And as a party, and I think it's it's a real testament to the equity piece. Uh, we need to to tackle this problem. I know that in my community um, and in uh, communities across Ontario, people can't find places to live, um, and so industries don't have workers because there's no affordable housing. There's no there's no homes under seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So if you're a young family. Um, or if you're from a vulnerable situation, uh, the the list uh, to get into public housing, the waiting list is, you know, upwards of five years. And that's just, it's unacceptable. So, uh, yeah, that, that seems to be 30% finding affordable housing is one of the major top concerns when we think about Ontario's economy. Uh, another close one is um, being equipped to adapt to a changing economy. And, and we can speak to those results as we go on. Um, and as I, as I turn to, to all of you to get your reactions on these poll results, I just want to remind people that as we go into the Q&A session, um, where those polling results are, there's a little section that says Q&A. So when we do move on to the Q&A part, just to put your questions into there so that the panel can see them. Um, okay, so let's let's get chatting about these results. Um, and uh, but is the pandemic? Um, the pandemic has devastated many many people. Uh, it's been hard on our business. Uh, it's been hard on women. Uh, incredibly hard. More women have left the workforce as a result of COVID to either to care for sick family members or to care for their children. Uh, I know that my kids have been doing their Zoom calls uh, from my workplace, and I'm lucky that I can bring them here. Uh, how do you think we can tackle uh, what we've been called uh, 
and get women back into the workforce to help build a stronger economy? How do we how do we create those kinds of conditions? And and you can react to the poll results as well and bring them in. Um, and and we'll just keep the discussion quite open. Whoever wants to jump in, um, you know, maybe Abhijit. I know it's hard to direct because we'll all start talking over each other with Zoom. So maybe Abhijit, you want to? I think to that I think uh, since we're talking about you know women um, in the C she session, I think it'd be more appropriate if Diane went first and you know talked about those issues. Well, the first thing is keep schools open, right? Absolute craziness that this government's priorities have been uh, everything else, right? Car dealerships, patios, um, uh, golf courses, not schools. Schools are absolutely essential, not, I mean, they're essential for women so that women can actually work. You cannot do full-time childcare and full-time jobs at the same time. Um, and most of that burden does tend to fall on the women. But so anyway, so that's the first thing is to keep the schools open, keep the schools safe. Uh, we've seen over and over again, this government refusing to reduce class sizes, to put in the money to improve ventilation, to do the testing so that schools can be open. It's number one. Um, the second thing is uh, have care workers and spaces for care workers for both for children. And I'm living that in my family. Um, um, my family had a baby born during the pandemic and all childcare options evaporated. So what does his mother do? And I'm not exactly available to, to do much either besides we've been bubbled separately. So there have been no options available for, for pe people, usually women who are looking after either small children or also in my case, elderly relatives. And we know that caregiving jobs have incredibly low carbon footprints. So which kinds of jobs uh, can provide a better economy, a better quality of life? Well, good care jobs that are decently paid and treated with dignity um, would make life better for all of us. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Diane. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we need to do is just listen to what women are saying. Um, you know, there's so many different advocacy groups um, that are giving specific recommendations of what they want. Uh, one of the things is what you mentioned, Diane, in the first place uh, regarding the green recovery, but uh, procurement, government procurement uh, is definitely something that we can use to incentivize diversity and inclusion. That's one of the many things that they're talking about. And as the largest customers, both in the economy, governments have tremendous power over suppliers. So. Currently, the public sector uh, request for uh, proposal processes are driven almost entirely by short-term cost considerations. So companies with the strong diversity inclusion models don't necessarily get rewarded that way. So despite evidence that there's a lot of economic and social value with that. Um, and Toronto was actually one of the first municipalities in Canada to implement supplier diversity, and that practice uh, needs to pick up more. Uh, further certifying bodies such as women business enterprises, uh, I think can make, make it easier for uh, businesses who are majority uh, owned or managed by women. Um, and then lastly, I think also representation matters, right? Because how are you going to listen to women if they're not there at the decision table? Um, so we need to include women in all decision-making bodies around economic recovery. So whether that's steering committees uh, established to tackle specific challenges or decision-making bodies within the public or private sectors. Um, and they should include representatives from groups that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So including making sure that there are, you know, intersectionalities included in that as well, uh, because those lived experiences uh, give so much more feedback and so much more insight that some of us can't even think about. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we need to focus on as well. Yeah, there's another thing I, I would suggest uh, in my podcast, Green Economy Heroes, I uh, recently interviewed a woman who's running, uh, started and running a battery company. And um, she's, she's gay. And she mentioned that how important it had been to her that she'd been routinely excluded from financing and networks for many years. And then in the US, they had a specific convention for LGBTQ companies, women and men running small companies to network with each other 
and to look for financing um, basically among themselves and with appropriate institutions so that that would allow them to take off. So more of those focused opportunities for networking, mutual education, looking for financing, uh, they seem to have a lot of power. Yeah, if I could just quickly add to that, and both of you are bang on, um, is that I was on the province's economic recovery committee last summer, and a number of women-owned small business owners in particular came to committee. And if you think of a lot of the small businesses that have been particularly hard hit by COVID, so personal care, uh, hospitality industry, uh, caring services in general are mostly women-owned businesses. And, and the need for access to capital, the need for access to, to sort of um, those support networks for those businesses, one, to survive the pandemic, and two, to be able to recover coming out of the pandemic. And childcare, uh, as Diane mentioned, it comes up over and over again. And I think it's, it, it's hopeful that the federal government has really stepped up to the plate and announced a national child care pro- plan. The bottom line is if the province of Ontario doesn't partner with the federal government, it's not going to happen in our province. And so it's one of the things that Greens absolutely are committed to and that, you know, I don't see the Ford government even talking about that issue. And, and for a government that seems to be so focused on we're good for the economy, seems completely tone deaf of the importance of schools, child care, supporting women-owned businesses um, is to our economy and will be to economic recovery. Yeah, those are, that's absolutely key. The childcare piece is key. And um, I know that conversations that I've had with colleagues and, and female small business owners, it's just, you know, it was, it was a tough call. I think, the Ontario government in terms of reopening schools because they didn't put those investments in pull saver to make class sizes smaller with respect to COVID, which then set up a situation uh, wherein, you know, teachers, a lot of teachers didn't feel safe uh, going back. However, on the other hand, uh, three weeks of, you know, going back into the classrooms or four weeks or for the month of June would have made all the difference. I mean, that four weeks, especially for young children, is, you know, longer than standard summer camps. Uh, and it really could have helped a lot of folks recoup some costs. Uh, that they share um, and would have made it a lot easier for them to focus on reopening their businesses. I know for for me, it was a challenge, you know, with this like very quick, we're going to reopen early, which in a way was good, but there's a lot of prep that goes into reopening. Uh, you know, for us, we had to put up our patio early and we weren't really ready for it. And um, so re- realistically, it's, you know, taking a holistic view of all of the stakeholders and um, and sort of different folks. Just acknowledging that we need childcare that's affordable. Uh, and that's something when I was campaigning in 2018 um, that was that was really interesting because I required you know so much help from family just to watch my kids. And, and so when we talk about um, the she session, we're talking about our general economy, but I think we can also talk about the political realm where a lot of women can't actually get into politics because there's no one to watch their kids, emotional work that women do at home. Um, there's no one to kind of step in and take that on. And, you know, the scheduling for their children's extracurriculars or figuring out who's going to go where today while I go out door knocking or canvassing. Um, these are things we need to do together as a community to ensure that more women can get into politics and, and really focus on the work that they want to do in their communities. They need support from their communities, but they also need support uh, from from the party in a way. Um, right. I, I don't know if, if any of you want to speak to this, but, you know, what's the GPO doing specifically? Um, we talk about 
uh, gender and equity and, and Greens really have made that a commitment, a key piece of bringing more people and in particular women uh, and just helping them iron out, you know, how can I, how can I run as a candidate who, you know, if I can't really, you know, afford to have someone watch my kids. So it's a. Yeah, I can take the first uh, stab at answering that one. Uh, so I, one of the things I'm really proud of is the party has launched our Take the Lead campaign, which is really designed to target uh, candidate recruitment for equity deserving candidates, which would include women, black, indigenous, racialized communities, people with disabilities, people who have you know, generally been more excluded from the political process. And we've set up, we've established a fundraising campaign to not only actively recruit equity deserving and more diverse candidates, but to then provide funding support to those campaigns and to provide that support in a way that works best for those campaigns. And so one of it, one of the, one of the things is could be childcare, or it could be just ensuring that instead of spending the time having to fundraise, you have some of those funds so you can focus on campaigning when you have the time to do that. And so I think those types of initiatives are, are vital. And because we're mostly have a green party audience today, I just, want to put the challenge out to all the writing associations that um, there's a lot of research that says, you know, you have to ask a woman seven times to run. So when you're recruiting candidates, don't just ask once or twice or even three times, ask seven times. And I've had others suggest to me that if you, if it's a black woman or an indigenous woman or a woman from a racialized community, you have to ask even more than seven times. <laughs> and we know that there are incredible candidates from all walks of life. And so I would put the challenge out to all of our writing associations to do the hard work on the ground to recruit candidates that really reflect our communities. Uh, and the GPO Central Committee will, Central Party will support that work. That's a great answer. That's so that's so mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and uh, if does anyone else want to speak to this specifically? We also have lots of we could definitely move on to those. Um, so we have one here uh, from Stephen Kazza. Um, and these are uh, questions that were pre submitted online. Um, how will the Green Party grow? grow the province's economy, establishing long-term permanent employment, benefiting and integrating our new citizens and Indigenous communities, which actually, you know, attacks into everything we're talking about, the, the gender and equity piece, um, and we're also talking about building a strong economy. And it, it's really interesting, as Stephen uh, talked about the word grow. So, uh, you know, we can kind of think about, you know, what do we really want from growth? I mean, do we do we really want growth or do we want something something a little bit different than that? Um, anyone who wants to good. come in on this? Yeah, well, Laura, I'm glad you, you said that because we do need to redefine what we mean by grow. Right? The, again, one of the basic elements of science that Greens know is it, it cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. And we know that humans have already used up most of the biomass of the world and are overwhelming the capacity of ecosystems. So what we, and it's one of the problems with using GDP, I love the Bob Robert Kennedy quote that Abhijit used, GDP is the wrong measure. GDP measures how we take nature and convert it into short-term money and leave trash behind. We, we need to define, redefine what we mean by success so that we're including the health of the natural world, the health of, of our community, and we are dramatically de-emphasizing the amount of money flowing to the richest, right? So that's been the way it goes. Um, so, Again, I, I keep going back to retrofitting buildings because we know that that's one of the easiest 
quickest thing to do. Ontario spends, you know, depending on the price of oil, 15, 20, 25 billion dollars every year just importing fossil fuels into the province. And that's money that drains away and doesn't leave anything behind except pollution. So anything that we can do to reduce our use of fossil fuels keeps more money in the province, gives us the opportunity to convert that money into jobs. We have enormous fossil fuel subsidies. In 2016, when I did my first energy report, I was able to extract out of the province the fact that they were spending uh, $625 million every year in tax breaks for fossil fuels. That's money that could go to building green infrastructure and um, paying for more teachers in schools and all those other kinds of things that provide good long-term jobs. So we we do actually know the, all the key things we have to do. We just have to be willing to do them. Yeah, totally agree, Diane. I, I mean, anything more than what we're doing now would be beneficial economically, right? Like the Ford government is doing not even the bare minimum. Um, and, and, and I understand for many people, a green transition can seem like a scary thing affecting their lives, their employment, and that's understandable. But what look what the Green Party of Ontario is talking about. The, the, the green and caring economy that we're talking about ensures that, you know, even current fossil fuel sector workers or get retrained, cared for, transitioned into quality jobs. Uh, it, Diane talked about this in wind, in solar, geothermal, uh, green hydrogen. In, in these investments in clean energy today, uh, I, I think Corporate Night is the is the magazine that Diane quoted earlier, um, or she wrote in earlier. And but they've said that you know uh, this is an economic opportunity worth like twenty six trillion dollars, which could contribute to approximately seven hundred thousand jobs per year in the sector. That's a full time, highly paid jobs. So I think this is an economic opportunity that we're missing out on, uh, which will help fund the caring part of our uh, economic vision. Yeah, if I could just add, and I, I, I want to just, we've talked about corporate nights. You know, I met with some economists that did a, some, a study for corporate nights and a $5 billion provincial building retrofit program would leverage $80 billion in private sector capital investment, create over 800,000 jobs, significantly reduce climate pollution, and uh, lower people's energy bills because they can save money by saving energy. Uh, and the bottom line with things like building retrofit jobs is those are jobs you can't export to another country. Like those are jobs that have to be done in Ontario by Ontario companies uh, employing Ontarians. Um, just last week, I was debating in the House the fact that the Ford government wants to ramp up gas uh, electricity generation in Ontario, which would increase climate pollution by 300% over the next decade. Uh, and at the same time, they it was part of debating a bill where they're essentially eliminating any special grid access for renewables. And Bloomberg estimates that the fastest growing sector of job growth over the next decade is going to be in renewable energy. As a matter of fact, renewable energy created far more jobs in the oil and gas sector over the last five years, and Bloomberg projects that far out in over the next couple of decades. And yet, you know, the current government is just doubling down on a 1950s style economy rather than making the investments of where the puck is going to go and to make sure that we make the proper investments in Ontario right now to ensure that we address the climate crisis. But by making those investments, we're investing in the exact areas where we have emerging markets and new career opportunities and new job opportunities. So I would argue that not only is the imperative for like long-term employment, but um, was part of uh, Stephen's question. Not only is it an imperative for economic job creation, wealth, prosperity in Ontario for us to make the grand the green transition. I mean, obviously, there's a moral imperative to do it to address the climate crisis as well. And also, I kind of want to speak about what Diane mentioned earlier. You know, like our I think our economic systems themselves need to change in sort of a 
basic way. Like, you know, currently the take, make, and then waste kind of model that we have, um, it, make things to sell for profit, then consumers deal with the waste. Essentially, I think I remember Ralph calling it um, uh, privatizing profit and socializing risk. You know, that's the kind of the model that we have currently. And so a circular economy, you know, uses those resources more responsibly, uh, repairing, reusing existing goods, materials, ending disposable consumption. Um, so those kinds of economic models need to be encouraged and they need to be done by government policy. Yeah, absolutely. These answers have all been so interesting. And in particular, as we're talking about jobs and as we're talking about, um, you know, reshaping our economy and having different types of work that people are doing, keeping it local. Uh, one of uh, our um, convention and um, attendees has asked an excellent question. Uh, this question is from Morgan Dandy Hanna. She asks, how can we encourage young people to enter trades instead of of so many and then still not being able to get a job this is a really excellent question how can we encourage folks to get into the trades because a lot of this work around retrofitting is is going to be in that field so what are your thoughts on that well i i think that there's a couple of pieces to it one is that the trades have to be a more welcoming place for women and and um um, black, Indigenous people of color, but then they have been. So there are some great programs that have been used to uh, encourage uh, minorities and, and women and give them a start and, um, so that they're not alone and not left to deal alone with, you know, we saw this craziness this week where uh, these two guys running a podcast bragging to each other as how they would try to grope women going by and then sued the woman who released the clip from their podcast. I mean, this is, this is, this is idiocy, but it does remind us that a lot of those things haven't changed that much. However, it is also true that many women are good with their hands. Many, many women would like to have the opportunity and, and you know, uh, minorities would like to have jobs with their hands. One of the stories that I tell on my podcast is about Aki Energy in Manitoba. And so when it, I was amazed to learn that more than half of the, red, the certified geothermal installers in all of Manitoba are First Nations people who learned on reserve. And they were almost always people that had major barriers to employment before. So um, Aki Energy does this, they get money from, they don't get any government grants. Um, they borrow money from foundations as an investment, which they pay back. At, um, they use the money to invest in real serious hands-on training, and they pay it back partly through the energy savings, but also partly through the social savings of getting people off welfare and off the very expensive frontline services um, circuit. So that's a model we should absolutely follow. Uh, and one other thing is education, making the trades more accessible during school and letting people letting people try it out. Uh, local benefit agreements when new projects are built to help make sure that local uh, people get first crack at the jobs, apprenticeship programs, there's lots of things we could be doing. Yeah, I completely agree, Diane. I, I, I'm, I was thinking of the the, the almost the stigma piece that's attached with uh, with trades, especially in um, you know racialized or marginalized communities. Now, I'm I'm a person of color. I remember when I was growing up and in high school, I didn't even consider it as an option, you know, because there's just this culture of that. Oh no, you have to go get a university degree, and anything other than that is like. Um, a complete no-no. Um, so I think we need to, uh, I think, bring in the education piece into those communities. I agree that there are systemic barriers in place which dissuade many of them from even thinking about it. But then there's also, I think, uh, a lack of knowledge about the economic opportunities that it provides. Um, so I think there's, I think we need to make sure that many of the marginalized and racialized communities understand how economically beneficial and actually uh, lifestyle uh, uh, liberating these uh, um, uh, jobs are because you can set your own schedule. You're essentially a small business owner. 
when you do these trades, right? So it's, um, it's I think, uh, one of the missing pieces there. And I think governments and the education system has a big role to play there. Yeah, I think both of you have really nailed it. So I just want to tell a story. I remember my, my daughter is a university student or graduating and um, her boyfriend was apprenticing to be a plumber. And she asked me what I thought about that. And I said, well, that's great. He'll earn far more than an MPP earns if you're worried about salary. And I think a lot of people don't realize the trades are very well-paying jobs. We have a shortage of people in the trade. So there's a lot of jobs available. And um, I think Les was bang on with the question that a lot of the jobs that are needed for the transition to a green economy are going to be jobs in the trade. And, and so there's huge opportunities. And I know one of the things when we were on the province's economic recovery committee, a number of people came to committee and specifically talked about the need for targeted investments and targeted programs that support women, support black, indigenous, uh, people of color to enter into the trades because there are systemic barriers and there have been numerous instances of misogynistic or systemic racism with, within some trades. I don't wanna anyway generalize or overemphasize, but, but we've seen numerous examples of that. I mean. Some of the, the incidents that have happened on construction sites, for example. And, and so government, I think, has an important role to play to help dismantle those barriers and to make sure uh, people have the supports to go into the trades. Yeah, mm -hmm. like to your, to your earlier question about the poll war, when, when we saw about the unaffordable housing, and I mean, there are systemic issues that led, that lead us there. Um, but I, I just think of all the all my friends uh, who own their own homes, and uh, the only ones that do are the ones that are in trades. They're the only ones who can actually afford a home in in this weird, messed up world. But that's that's just that just shows that to any young people listening today, or if there are any young people in your lives, uh, whoever is listening today, I would really encourage them uh, to take a serious look at the trades. Yeah, these are these are all such great answers, and and I just want to um, again, it's related uh, because we're talking about education and affordable housing. Um, you know, getting into these fields requires you to to have a plan and and the ability to to go and get an education. And um, one of um, our again attendees has asked an excellent question: uh, Can the panelists speak more about shifting a social assistance? GBI, guaranteed basic income. How would we as Greens see that working? And that's submitted from Michael Johnson. Thank you for that question. Uh, I know Abhijit talks a lot about, he's very passionate about uh, GBI and UBI. And, uh, and certainly that is such a key piece of allowing people to have support so that they can go out and, and get an um, re-educate themselves in a new field or something like that. So maybe Abhijit, you want to pick start? Yeah, start it's it's uh, this morning as I was you know scrolling through my Twitter, uh, uh, one of my uh, people who uh, are my followers and I follow them, mutual followers, they tweeted about you know if I had universal basic income today, I would go back to school and get and finish my degree. You know, like I, I actually was thinking, oh, maybe, you know, that's that's such a great tweet to like think about, like ask people what would they do if they had if there was UBI in Canada today. And if you follow the um, there's a great Facebook page and they have they're on all social media platforms called the Humans of Basic Income um, that are uh, testaments of uh, the different people who are on the basic income pilot here in Ontario before it was canceled by Doug Ford. Um, it's run by a friend, Jesse Golem, and uh, she's documented all these people and the amazing benefits that they got. You know, people who are on ODSP or Ontario Works who could finally start having enough to, you know, not uh, have to ration at the end of the month. Um, who, uh, people who started new businesses, new small businesses, people who went back to school. 
Um, you know, there's, it, it has such great economic potential, not only of liberating our lives, but also creating new jobs. And, and I think there's this sort of um, fallacious view of it that it, it's actually uh, uh, going to lead to less jobs or um, uh, uh, less economic output. But I think the opposite is, is actually the case. If you, if you go to ubiworks.ca, it's a great another website which shows you detailed statistics of how uh, a universal basic income or a guaranteed global income will actually increase the amount of jobs and economic output here in Ontario. Uh, so there's, the, there's many different ways and formats that it would look like, but I think first is understanding that we need to have it. Um, um, and, in, and I think uh, in terms of how it would look like, there's, there's uh, you know, it could be something like a dividend in check uh, format to go out two thousand dollars, just like CERB. Um, but that those those debates, I think, are more uh, you know for the later part. I think first we have to agree that we need universal basic income, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, CERB has changed uh, Canadians' um, uh, acceptance of that idea, and I think it's an idea whose time has come. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in and just say that I was really proud in the last election. We were the first party in Ontario history to actually have a fully costed uh, plan to bring in a guaranteed basic income, guaranteed level income uh, in Ontario. And I wanna make three quick points. So one argument against it is that it will discourage people from working. Every academic study on basic income has shown that actually people's employment rates go up. And if their employment rate doesn't go up, it's because they're going they have the economic uh, means to go upgrade their skills and, and be educated and then get a better paying job. So that's one. Two is um, we're increasingly living in an economy where more and more people are being pushed into being entrepreneurs. And for some people, that's great. For others, that's a challenge. But the bottom line is, is and I can tell you this as a small business owner myself and an entrepreneur is that if you don't have basic economic security, it's very hard to start a business. It's very hard to be an entrepreneur. And so actually having a basic income where there's a floor that nobody goes below actually creates more opportunities for entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, which I think are going to be important components of, one, the shift to a green economy, because we need more innovation and, and more new ways of doing things. And then the, the third one for me is, is that the cost benefits to the rest of society are underestimated. The burden on our healthcare system, the burden on our, so our criminal justice system, the burden on our social systems um, because of poverty uh, has significant financial impacts. And so when we did our costing, we didn't even cost in the potential savings because we knew that econo the economists and others would may maybe question that. But there have been a number of studies that have suggested that a lot of the benefits of a basic income will lead to financial savings and other parts of uh, government budgets. Diane, I don't know if you want to speak to this as well. Um, I'd love to bring you in on this because obviously this is, you know, every, very central. Right. Um, I was very impressed by the BC study last year that looked at whether uh, universal basic income by itself would provide the results that we want. Um, so that's not exactly what the current um, Green Party platform calls for, but I think it's, it's incredibly well-researched and uh, basically their recommendation was don't throw out our current system, fix it, that many people need more than a check. They need wraparound supports. They need, um, they need focus support for their particular needs. And so, um, yeah, anyway, that was their that was their basic take is definitely the starvation system that Mike Harris set up that has been continued ever since 
you know, the, the argument at the time was, well, if you gave people a real incentive, they'd work harder, right? That, that people were poor because they were lazy. That, that, was, that was and remains the conservative viewpoint. And we've now had, uh, ever since Mike Harris, we've had people stuck in generational poverty with no way out. So that idea has been tried and has conspicuously failed. And so now we, we have to recognize that very often um, people suffer misfortune uh, through no fault of their own. And they won't find a way out of it by being punished. They will find a way out of it through community support and help, um, the kind of help that they actually need. And I, I hope that we can help make that happen. I could just Thanks. add, I think Diane brings up a good point that um, a lot of people need to recognize is that in addition to a basic income, people are still gonna need access to mental health and addiction support and services. People are still gonna need, uh, particularly um, people who are experiencing chronic homelessness are going to need access to permanent supportive housing with wraparound services. And so some proponents of basic income tend to be like hand people a check and then get rid of all other social supports. And others tend to, like us, tend to be like, we need to have those social supports in place and people need basic income security because no one can live on what the current social assistance rates in Ontario, which is seven hundred thirty dollars for somebody in Ontario works. Can you imagine like where in Ontario can you live on 730? Like where in Ontario can you rent a couch to sleep on for $730, let alone meet all your monthly expenses. And for somebody on Ontario disability support and people with disabilities tend to have more expenses in their life, they're being asked to live on around $1,100 a month. And again, how, you, you can barely find a place to rent for $1,100, let alone meet all your other uh, basic needs. Yeah, thank you so much. Those are all such great answers. And I wanna to get to one last question from, <clears throat> from the audience, from Selena. She asks, and again, it's related to everything we've been talking about. How work at a fossil fuel industry job to put food on their table, that voting green or transitioning to a green economy is essential. How do we explain that to someone? That's from Selena. Well, I mentioned this before. In fact, I think we are overestimating the, that problem. What we've seen now in Alberta is thousands upon thousands of highly skilled, devoted people losing their jobs and not finding opportunities to get back into the economy that they thought they would be able to live in. And so we have groups like Iron and Steel, a labor group calling for an on-ramp, help us find jobs in the renewable economy. Um, federal government funded a, a training program to help people transition, and they had spots for dozens of people, and they had many hundreds of people applying. I, I think we should not be focusing anymore on how do we persuade people that the transition is happening. I think most people know it's happening. What we need to do now is create concrete opportunities and help so that people can make the transition and can find a job that will use their skills. And lots of people in the oil and gas industry have skills that are exactly what we need for the green transition. They, they, they maybe need some help getting there, but we need their strengths. And uh, so it's more of a matchmaking job and uh, helping with the temporary re re Repositioning, which is sometimes moving, sometimes reskilling, sometimes just making new networks. And that's what I think we need to focus on. Yeah, if I could build on that a little bit. So in, in Ontario, um, most of the fossil, most of the fossil fuel related industry jobs are either people who work for manufacturing companies that supply the oil sands. And a lot of those companies can manufacture other products that will be a part of the green transition. For example, manufacturing wind turbines or manufacturing battery storage or, or manufacturing uh, solar panels. I mean, there's a whole host of, uh, of manufacturing opportunities in, in, the, in the clean economy. The second area is primarily targeted or focused in the Sarnia region. So most of the oil and plastics refining happens in, in that region. 
And so, first of all, um, there are, I, I would argue that, that a lot of the skills related to those jobs are transferable uh, to other industries. And second of all, in those areas where, where there is a need for um, more, let's say, durable plastics, for example, that would go into the automotive industry. So I'm not talking like single use throwaway plastics. Um, there's huge opportunities and there's already I've two or two or three plants now um, around uh, bio-based plastics where the inputs are not fossil fuels, but they're actually waste products from Ontario's agricultural industry or forestry industry. And so why not keep that money in Ontario? Like why buy oil and gas from Alberta as your feedstock for those plants when we could be buying the feedstock from Ontario farmers, for example. Um, or in, in, in many cases, it's, it's products that they're currently um, um, are just going into a waste stream for them anyway. And, and so we can keep that money in Ontario. And then the third area that's tangentially related is transportation emissions are obviously the largest source of climate pollution in Ontario. That's largely driven by, you know, personal vehicles and, and commercial trucks. So first of all, we have the capacity in Ontario to manufacture that and, and electrify it. Second of all, there's huge opportunity. So I think Ontario is very well positioned to be a global leader in, in clean electrified transportation. Second of all, there's huge opportunities in modal ship to shipping more goods by rail. And again, Ontario is very well positioned to be a leader in, in both manufacturing and, and um, execution of rail transport. And so I think a lot of those jobs that may be considered old economy jobs, there's huge opportunities in the emerging markets, emerging clean economy uh, fields. And if we don't lead the transition to those jobs, others will. And so why not have Ontario creating those jobs and being the market leader in, in those job areas? Because that's where the global economy is going. And so, you know, we might as well, we might as well lead and we're going to then benefit uh, from the economic prosperity, job creation and new career opportunities that exist for people. Yeah, absolutely. And thank and you think, so much. Oh, sorry. Is it, is it OK if I go? No, go ahead, Abhijit. OK, thanks. Um, I, I was just going to say that uh, I think uh, it's so crucial to also, I think uh, there's such a crucial missing education piece there um, uh, or like really a marketing piece, I think, about, you know, like instead of the millions of dollars that the Ford government wasted on, you know, stickers that don't stick in gas station pumps or, uh, you know, attacking the federal government on through TV ads. I mean, you can create ads that actually show people the different connections that exist between their current skill sets and what the green future uh, brings. So, for example, you can show, you know, construction workers uh, that energy efficient retrofits or low carbon social housing. You can show auto making automaker workers uh, by building electric vehicles. You can show stem cell uh, stem field workers about clean tech. You know, jobs in expanded public transportation child care, elder care, all vital low carbon employment. So I think there's a missing piece from the government um, as well about, you know, what we can actually do. And there's so many possibilities uh, with what you already have. You don't even need that many upgrades. Yeah. It's just a quick pivot. It's so, it's so true. And actually, you know, I think that uh, I think that Mike can um, certainly wrap wrap up our conversation now to just talk, talk get us back right to what do thank you for having me, uh, Mike? Uh, how can you how can you uh, I guess what are the main takeaways from this conversation? Yeah. Well, first of all, Laura, thank you so much for for moderating and and guiding us through the conversation and. I want to thank the GPO team and the tech team that's been helping us put on the GPO um, convention all weekend long, but especially today. Uh, and both Abhijit and Diane, um, it's a real honor to be able to work with both of you. I think we have a fantastic leadership team that really complements each other. And I'm incredibly excited 
about the number of people stepping forward to be candidates for the Green Party. And so once again, I just want to give another shout out to our Take the Lead campaign and encourage uh, everyone to, to consider running as a candidate. And I really encourage those of you who have the financial means to donate to our campaign fund to support equity deserving candidates. Um, I think it's really important for the GPO to go into the next election uh, with a very diverse uh, range of candidates, diversity by age, by, by, by gender, uh, by race, by faith, by uh, abilities, et cetera. Um, and I guess the conclusion that I've come for, come the, for me, is that the real, that we want to have a moral imperative to transition to a green economy to address the climate crisis, but there's huge economic benefits to being to doing that, and there are huge benefits to creating more caring and inclusive communities by doing that. And so I think we can all have a better, higher quality of life and have more economic equity and prosperity if we invest in a green and caring recovery coming out of COVID. Awesome. Thank you so much and have a fantastic rest of your Sunday. Thank you so much, Laura.